thank you and hello to um, uh, many friends at uh, USC, uh, to, to Justin, Helena, and others there who um, I really want to um, uh, always enjoy chatting with. So I'm going to talk today, um, uh, address this title, Rare Mutations in Neurodegeneration and Their Application Understanding Disease. And the place where uh, most of this work has been done and many insights have derived is in uh, Colombia, um, where a lot of my research has been conducted over the past 25 or so years. Um, this uh, research has been done in very close collaboration with a neurologist uh, in Medellin named uh, Francisco Lopera, and I'll talk more about him in a moment. Um, but this is just to familiarize yourself a little bit with some of the uh, geography in the states or departamentos in, uh, in Colombia here. Most of our work is focused on Antioquia and um, families um, in that region there that you can see. And uh, there's been many trips down there and uh, bringing together families and really pulling together uh, the genetics. And uh, on some other occasion, uh, we can talk about the details of many, many stories of um, interactions with these families and um, both the sad and wonderful um, uh, uh, kinds of histories that they have to tell us and teach us. So there is um, uh, that uh, Dr. Lopera back in the 80s, and then I joined him in the early 90s, um, he had originally uncovered a, um, a large family in which uh, there was uh, dementia being inherited uh, in generation after generation. It looked like it was an autosomal dominant based on the family tree. Uh, it looked like it was dementia, but we didn't know the gene at the time. We didn't know that it was indeed Alzheimer's as it turned out to be. Um, but since that time, over the past uh, three decades, um, we have really learned a lot. Uh, we have figured out what the gene is. It's a uh, presenilin one with um, E2ADA mutation. And uh, in the neuropathology, we know now that the disease is indeed textbook uh, Alzheimer's disease. The family is huge. You're just seeing a, a part of it here, but this is a very significant part of it because these are individuals in which we also know the age of dementia onset. And uh, the mean age of onset in this kindred, like many presenilin mutations in which that are autosomal dominant and highly penetrant, um, you know, which means if one parent has it, the other, the offspring are, have a 50% chance of getting it. And the mean age of um, onset tends to be around 49, 50 years of age. But as you can see, um, there, uh, up on the upper left, there's a color code up there, and you can see that uh, there are some people that get it much later. If you look carefully at this picture, there are a few individuals that are colored purple, and those are outliers. They fall far outside the mean, and even though they too share this very strong uh, dominant mutation, they're not getting it at the same age as everyone else. They're delayed by as much as um, 10, 15, sometimes 20 years. So we wanted to search for genetic variants that delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease. We conducted this uh, genetic study of uh, age of onset in 344 individuals. Um, and um, in a subset of 80 individuals, we had whole genome sequencing. The others um, were uh, array analysis. Uh, and we were able to do a lot of imputation there from the whole genomes. The final cohort had a mean age of onset, as I sort of mentioned before, was 49.2 years of age. But look at the range, 37 to 75 years. And after doing this entire analysis, which I'll show you some details in a moment, but the bottom line was that um, the genetic variation, that is not just the mutation, but other variants that showed up in their genomes, could ex explain 56.4% of the variants in the age of onset. Now that is, um, there's two ways to look at that. One means that we, one interpretation is, is that we have other gene variants that we can look at that are affecting this very strong mutation. And even in the face of the mutation are still affecting the age of onset. That's interesting. The other interesting part is, is that the remainder of that, you know, another over 40% of it is of the variants is not related to genetics. And you could ask, well, what is that variance due to? And we don't know, but of course, we talk a lot about lifestyle and uh, you know, controlling of uh, other factors such as blood pressure that may um, contribute to the um, age of onset of Alzheimer's disease. So here is um, a plot which shows um, 
the, um, at the bottom are all the variants down here. And um, on the um, y-axis, you can see the age at onset. Uh, there's a line there which shows the mean age of onset. And all those numbers at the bottom there where they have RS values are, um, are polymorphisms in the genome, individual variants that, in, that, that people have. And um, you can see that there are some individuals that have these variants at the bottom that are way up at the top of this uh, plot. They're up there around 70, 75 years. In fact, there's three red bars along the top. Maybe you can see that just above age 70 where my arrow is that um, are way outside the mean and have this variant. Now that doesn't mean that the variant is a cause and effect um, because there's few numbers of people. It's really difficult to get really clear cut uh, statistics. But the genome-wide significance for this, as you can see, is 10 to the minus 8, 5 times 10 to the minus 8. So there are some interesting leads here that these variants may be contributing to delaying the age of onset uh, in these individuals. And that's a place where we have a lot more work to do to delve into those variants. You won't be surprised to learn that uh, they tend to fall in non-coding parts of the genome. Uh, there were some um, also homozygous rare variants that were in the coding regions, um, and uh, here are um, two of them in these two genes here, which um, are also demand more work. They have had some association with Alzheimer's disease, and another one with um, uh, in a known risk factor for Alzheimer's called uh, clusterin or CLU, and uh, these also showed up in uh, our study. So the bottom line here is is that um, this study, which um, is now under review, will give us some new leads for finding genes that may affect um, age and onset. Now, one uh, sort of validation of this was a finding that was um, recently published. Um, uh, we were included in this study, but the leader of the study was a former grad student of mine named Joseph Arboleda here, who published um, just last year in Nature Medicine this absolutely fascinating variant in APOE called the Christchurch variant. Uh, the variant uh, was first found in uh, Christchurch, New Zealand. At the time, it had nothing to do with Alzheimer's at all, but um, Joseph found that it um, uh, was associated, uh, it was present in an individual in this very large family, a family with the E2ADA mutation that had, um, that, that had was um, 30 years beyond the mean. Uh, age 70 and uh, or a little over 70 and still had very minimal um, Alzheimer findings, a little bit of MCI. So, um, uh, uh, so this person was absolutely fascinating, carried this Christchurch variant um, and in fact was homozygous for it. If you look down here at the family tree, uh, my arrow and this little arrowhead is pointing to the individual. This was uh, a family where there was consanguinity. Both parents had this very rare variant in the heterozygous condition, and they had a daughter here in that circle who is homozygous, and this is the individual who um, had this extraordinarily delay in the age of onset. Again, it's very, very hard to get cause and effect because this is a single case. Um, but falling in this APOE region uh, was, um, we think, uh, a very tantalizing clue. And um, what made it even more extraordinary was um, work done on this same individual by the senior author on the paper, Jacquel uh, Queiroz, uh, who um, did imaging on this patient. And um, remarkably, this patient had a lot of amyloid plaque in the brain, but really very little tau, very little tau spread. So there was uh, this dissociation between the classic hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and the tangles, where here's a person who accumulated amyloid, but failed to have tau spread through the brain. So this um, really interested us uh, immensely because of, um, of finding that um, we uh, were working on in parallel before we even knew about this uh, result from uh, Joseph. And that was work we were doing on mechanisms of tau spread. Um, so I'm gonna take you on a little detour now before we come back to the genetics and uh, 
talk uh, about a very interesting finding from our lab um, that really has uh, provided some insights on how tau is spread through the brain. As you probably are aware here, and uh, is a picture that's often shown from Brock's staging, is, is that people believe that um, tau pathology may begin down perhaps uh, in the entorhinal cortex, and um, it begins to spread in, um, uh, through the brain sort of um, along anatomical tracks, uh, and it spreads in um, a prion-like manner. And I emphasize the word prion-like because we have no evidence whatsoever that tau can uh, that tau is um, has many of the issues with pri with uh, with prion disease in which um, uh, brain tissue itself can be highly infectious. That's not the case. But the reason we make the analogy to prion is because there's no nucleic acid involved. That is, tau uh, can spread from cell to cell and template the misfolding of other tau normal tau proteins that are in the neighborhood. So tau spread has been a topic of great interest for quite some time. And um, there's been a search for how it spreads. So this is where um, uh, a uh, postdoc in my lab named Jennifer Rauch, who um, just this week has gone on to get a, uh, a faculty position at University of Massachusetts in Amherst. And she um, developed this assay in which she uh, uh, put cells in culture, and uh, put in tau fluorescently labeled and did a very simple thing, just looked at how the cells took up tau. But she did this in the, con in the context in which she individually suppressed different genes uh, using a, a CRISPR, well, I won't go into the details of how you do the suppression, it's a CRISPR technique, but um, she could individually um, suppress genes and, show, and find out those genes in which when a gene was suppressed, when did the cell not, no longer able to take up tau? And uh, she actually found something very interesting. The first finding she found over on the left here were that a category of um, molecules called heparin sulfate proteoglycans that are sitting on the ex uh, outside the cell that modifiers of those, um, th those proteins sitting outside the cell, that will uh, proteoglycans sitting outside the cell, uh, when you modify their, uh, their sulfation and other modifications on them, that you can affect tau uptake. And basically, if you're looking at this picture here, you see the line here up here, it says 100%, and then there's a, a red arrow here at a few genes when they're knocked down will reduce tau uptake. And we found this modestly interesting, it was reported in 2018, but it wasn't completely satisfying um, because it wasn't a complete uh, knockdown of tau uptake. And then, but Jenny did not give up, and she then decided to try a few more candidate genes. And one of them she tried was the LRP1 receptor. And this just um, totally blew us away, because now when you can see uh, here, there, there's, a, uh, I hope you're seeing my arrow, there is the LRP1 SGRNA, SG, that uh, stands for a guide RNA, in which uh, we knock down LRP1, and now tau uptake falls to zero. It's just, it's remarkable. This is a complete blockade of tau uptake. That's why we can make this statement that LRP1 is the receptor for tau uptake and responsible for its um, spread. So there you see that many other, even closely related members of the LRP1, of the LRP family do not have the same effect, a highly specific effect. So we think we have this receptor for spread. Well, what is LRP1? You can think of LRP1 as a kind of a trash can. It's sitting mostly outside the cell, collecting stuff that comes along that it wants to get rid of and recycling it, which is why I show up here, you know, you, that um, the, these bins, you put paper in some and cans or glass in others. Well, LRP1 uh, picks up certain things. It recycles uh, certain proteins that when they're accumulating outside cells, it brings them into the cell and destroys them. And, what, and, and this is why the Christchurch mutation fascinated us so much because one of the proteins to which LRP1 binds is APOE. And um, so here we were implicating now LRP1 in tau spread from this molecular point of view 
And it had just been found in the clinical context that an APOE variant called Christchurch will affect tau spread. LRP1 has been interesting uh, for years to the Alzheimer community because it's also a receptor for APP and probably for A beta. So, uh, so we pushed on that a little bit further. We can show now that uh, it's a little bit of a complicated slide, but the bottom line here is that when we would then move these experiments into animals, into mice, if we uh, suppress LRP1, you can, and then inject tau, you can prevent its spread. I won't go into all the details here, but just draw your attention to these blue figures here where under the control conditions, when we have uh, not suppressed LRP1, you can see this red, green, and yellow spreading all through from the hippocampus all the way around in different parts of the brain. In contrast that to the other blue over here where the uh, tau remains relatively confined to the injection site. Likewise, in IPS neurons, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells from humans, you can also see the fact that um, here when there's, um, when LRP1 is suppressed, uh, you don't see any green dots over here on the right, but there's tau with the green fluorescent dots over on the left being taken up when we're not suppressing LRP1. So here's the APOE story, the way we think about it, it's sort of a Janus face protein in which when you have APOE4, as you all know, uh, it's bad. It's the bad side of APOE. This is when uh, you know having APOE4 um, can increase your risk as much as eightfold when you have when you're homozygous for APOE4. Um, you start to have a, a very very high risk of getting Alzheimer's disease um, at a particularly early age. But then over on the other side of this two-faced creature, we have APOE2, which seems to be protective. And we now add to this list APOE Christchurch, um, which has the variant right there at the um, arginine to a serine uh, in this position, which is part of the receptor binding region of, um, of, of APOE, which is also particularly interesting because receptor binding means that's where it's actually potentially interacting with LRP1. So, um, so we have a lot of work to do here now. And just to sum up this part of the talk here, here's LRP1 sitting outside of the cell. Here's tau coming along up here in blue, binding to LRP1, getting taken up through endocytosis, and somehow templating this folding of normal tau in the cell to start to form tau inclusions. Here's APOE binding in here. Uh, I mentioned those heparin sulfate proteoglycans, they're probably involved. So this is, we believe this is a very important nexus where a lot of the uh, pathogenesis of Alzheimer pathology, especially tau pathology, is actually uh, centered. And we're particularly intrigued by these recent cryo-EM pictures of tau folding, where you get these different shapes and how um, when tau spreads from one cell to another and forms neurofibrillary tangles, as you know from you know, recent data, the way tau mist folds in these different conditions, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, corticobasal degeneration, or Alzheimer's disease, in these conditions, the, mis the shape of tau that's being transmitted from cell to cell is actually, a, is actually different. That somehow in cell, when, the, when tau passes from cell to cell, it has a memory of where, of the shape it had from the cell where it came from. And that is um, something that we're keenly interested in. Well, back to the genetics. So we have, um, uh, there's, um, we've recently done more genomes in Colombia because we were asking, are there more families like the one I showed you? And we're doing a lot of uh, sequencing now, uh, looking at many families in Colombia, not just this uh, one, families that are um, screened by, um, having early onset dementia and some family history. And Colombia is a particularly interesting area to do this because of this unique population structure, its demography. That is, Colombia is what we call a tri-continental admixture. Its genetic diversity is enormous. From like 20 or 25,000 years ago, there was gene flow carried by indigenous migratory streams that, were, that formed the uh, original population of the region as they came through across the Bering Strait and migrated down the coast of the Americas and populated the uh, all through the Americas and um, 
were a number of different uh, tribes there um, with high genetic diversity that was in which they were uh, separated for these tens of thousands of years. Then in 1492, the Spanish invaded and brought uh, more gene flow from Europe. Uh, they came looking for El Dorado, but since uh, they didn't find as much gold as they would have liked, they turned to another way to make money, which was to begin to import slaves from West Africa. And of course, as you know, the African population is incredibly diverse. It's the most genetically diverse population in the world. So we have these three uh, types, these three genomes that are all mixing together. And then an incredible thing happens. There's a bottleneck. They are suddenly hit by a list of diseases that uh, makes our current pandemic look trivial. Uh, something like 90% of the indigenous people were wiped out during uh, this uh, time period after 1492, throughout the uh, 1500s, when numerous diseases were affecting all of these people and the population just shrank remarkably. And uh, then what, as they began to pull out of this, people that settled in these different little regions and they survived. Uh, why did the few survive? We'll come back to that in a moment. But a few, they, there were survivors lived in these different, in small towns all through here. I'm showing you the map of Colombia, but this can be true for other areas of Latin America where uh, they settled and they started to have really huge families, 10, sometimes 15 children in a family. So this was now any kinds of, by chance, what we call drift mutations that were present in these remaining people were now expanded rapidly in these very large families. And we think that uh, has to do with the origin of the presenilin mutation I showed you, and now a bunch more. So here's a picture of the global ancestry of the population here. Um, this is uh, the population that we're looking at. You can see it's a mixture here of uh, individuals of European, Native American, and African, uh, as you can see here in these panels, which come from the Thousand Genomes Project. And um, the Colombian population on the far left, uh, labeled Tangle, is, um, has this, uh, this, this, this admixture. So here's some genes that we found. This is just remarkable. In this population, without even looking all that hard, uh, we came up with uh, a number of rare mutations that will cause uh, this, uh, this uh, syndrome of frontotemporal dementia, ALS. Um, and um, I'm sure many of you recognize some of these genes on this chart. Some of you may be studying them. Um, they're all very interesting. Here is uh, the tau gene, MAP, uh, MAP T, two variants here and uh, a number of others. Here's one of the families with a tau mutation, another very large family uh, that again might be uh, of interest as we start to think about uh, clinical trials. And the reason I mentioned clinical trials is because um, a little bit of work, not done by me, but by other neuropsychology, neuropsychologists in Colombia have begun to look at uh, the detection of frontotemporal dementia in this family. And you can see here that um, if you look at this uh, column here where it says, uh, well, here's a bunch of neuropsychological tests over here that were done on, all, on, on these individuals in the rows. And over here are carriers without dementia. And here are carriers with dementia, more or less the same age. And over here, non-carriers of also about the same age. So you can begin to see how some of the neuropsychological testing can really distinguish um, the uh, carriers with dementia, those without dementia, and non-carriers, which is very important for frontotemporal dementia clinical trials. We, have a, we, un, we know a lot about uh, the trajectory for Alzheimer's disease. And therefore, conducting those clinical trials has become a little more clear because we have biomarkers. But for frontotemporal dementia, that's a problem. And I think we have a little bit of a way to attack that problem when we look at these large families um, in this kind of a setting. Here's another family with a, a TAR-DPP, a TAR-DBP uh, mutation. Um, this is, um, this encodes a protein called uh, um, uh, uh, TDP43. And uh, this is so fascinating because this, in this same family here with this one mutation, we have some individuals with uh, primary progressive aphasia, 
others with the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia and ALS, so that the phenotypes with the same mutation can vary considerably. And here is, I think, the most remarkable thing, which is, uh, this is a list of 11 different families that have different independent mutations, all in the presenilin gene, all with early onset Alzheimer's disease. They come from different regions of Colombia. You can see here the towns, and uh, many of them are very large families, so that for some reason, these mutations in presenilin are um, collecting. Again, we'll talk about that reason in a moment. And um, here's where these people come from. The over on the right is the family I already showed you, the E2ADA mutation. When we analyze their genomes, we can tell that they originally come from Spain and uh, probably arrived at the time of the conquistadores, shown here. Whereas another one of the mutations, I416T, actually has its origin in um, Africa uh, and uh, came here during the time of the slave importation. So when you look at all of them together, now here's all 11 of them. Uh, you can see here, if you go down to the color code here, uh, of the 11, one is from Africa. Uh, the remaining, uh, there are three, I believe, from uh, of Native American origin. Um, there's more than three greens here because one of them is non-pathogenic. And um, then the rest are European. So, uh, so we have this diverse, this diversity in Colombia has given rise to multiple presenilla mutations of origins from three different continents. So um, here's how we do this kind of work. Uh, there uh, we have, uh, if you look over on the right, there's chromosome 14, which is where the presenilin gene resides. And um, every one of those horizontal lines is an individual's uh, genome in the region of presenilin, all aligned with each other. The vertical blue lines are where the mutation lies. And the length of the horizontal lines has to do with how much of the DNA is identical from one family member to the next. So this is an incontrovertible finding for a founder effect. They, they all have a very similar long stretches of DNA around the mutation that are identical. And uh, so this, uh, and we call these segments, IBD segment stands for identity by descent. Now, here's what we can do with this kind of data is we can actually show the global ancestry uh, uh, throughout their entire genomes. So here's a family, 264L. This is a family from the north of Colombia in an area called Monteria. And they have, uh, here are four of those individuals. Over in the pictures are their entire genomes. And you can see segments of their chromosomes in red, blue, or green that have to do with the origin of where those segments came from. And again, not surprising, they come from three different continents. But if you zero in on the segment around chromosome 14, where presenilin is, that particular segment is, comes from, has a Native American origin. And that is how we classify this family. So here is the um, very distinctive uh, genetic uh, history I talked about in Colombia, in which we have an admixture and this is then leads to a, a bottleneck. And then after the bottleneck, there's population expansion uh, in the absence of selection now, just rapidly expanding. People are healthy again. Um, and they're expanding locally. They're not moving very much. So the genetic map and the geographic map tend to overlap a lot. That really helps us to find uh, these people. And you can ask the question, what's going on? Is this selection or drift? Selection means is there some advantage for having these uh, mutations, particularly the presenilin mutations? That would mean a positive selection. Or is this just chance? That's what drift means. Is there just that they had this, uh, all of these, uh, uh, these diseases that indiscriminately killed people and those that were left happened to have these mutations? We don't have an answer for this question yet, but we're very intrigued with the idea that uh, perhaps um, there may be, at least in the case of the presenilin, some positive selection that is 
operative. The, and that means a positive selection against uh, dying of all those infectious diseases. Evolution doesn't particularly care if you get uh, dementia at, uh, when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, beyond the age of procreation. But it does care if you survive um, disease. And is there a way that presenilin and its tendency to produce a beta can be a um, beneficial for the people around in the late uh, in, in the 1500s, and th it, this is so. This is now the most speculative part of the presentation, but it is known that um, a beta uh, may be able to uh, work in the innate immune system in a very ancient innate immune system as a peptide, and there are others that are known, these are so-called antimicrobial peptides, that will attack invading organisms, wall them off, and uh, prevent disease. This is a hypothesis that uh, came up from Moore and Tansy, and um, this um, turns out um, that this, this hypothesis uh, may actually have been operative here in this uh, population. So I want to thank uh, the people that uh, did so much to make all of this uh, possible here. Um, as I mentioned in this picture in the upper left is Francisco Lopera, who um, is sort of the heart and soul of this entire project, the neurologist who has uh, collected this family over many years and a close collaborator of both of ours, uh, Lucia Madrigal, who has also been involved from the very beginning in uh, collecting the families. Uh, next to them is, uh, Juliana Acosta Uribe, a graduate student in my lab who did her MD training in Colombia and is now doing a PhD with me in genetics. Uh, David Aguillon, who is also from Colombia and working a lot on collecting these um, patients. Over here in the Zoom is our one of our lab meetings with a number of people from my lab. The genomic sequencing was done at Hudson Alpha, which is headed up by Rick Myers and a postdoc there who did the work named Nick Cochran. And here you can see some uh, photos of uh, our travels around Colombia over here, uh, Lucia Madrigal with a, uh, a patient in one of the barrios around Medellin. And over here is the uh, family I mentioned in uh, Monteria. So with that, I do want to thank you. And here's an extended list of um, the many people who contributed to this project. Thank you very much. Very nice. Um, very interesting. Lots of lots of science there. Um, so you left uh, plenty of um, time for questions, and I have many, but I'll let others uh, uh, go first if anybody has any. So I guess we can go through the chat. I don't see any in the chat box, um, but anyone should feel free to uh, unmute yourself uh, if you want to. <laughs> Yeah, I have a couple of questions, or maybe I can just ask one for now. Ken, that was great. Um, I noticed that in the the TDP forty three families, like the I three three V, there were several mutation carriers that were unaffected, but they appeared they were they seemed like they had they were older. Um, do you have any idea if those they might carry protective variants there? Or are there any, you know, examples in your pedigrees where you think that it's likely that there were some that in some individuals that were carriers, but then they had protective variants that we could look into, um, you know, to protect against like TDP43 proteinopathy? Um, yeah, um, boy, I wish I could answer you, Justin. The uh, uh, those, as you know, those are uh, uh, statistically hard to do. That family is smaller than the really big one. Um, but um, I think if we combine um, those mutations with some biology, um, you know, we might be able to find something. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great lead. But given the, uh, I guess the, the admixture and then the bottleneck, do, 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 does it make these pedigrees more advantageous for identifying potential protective variants or make, does it make it harder? Uh, I think it makes it more advantageous to find them. Uh, in the first place, because, um, and, and thank you for asking that, because I really uh, did want to elaborate a little bit on that. I was really a little unclear on how much time I had. Um, so 
the um, the the thing that um, uh, you get from uh, these highly inbred huge families are uh, runs of homozygosity. There's a lot of inbreeding, and uh, that means that uh, not only uh, because of the reasons I already mentioned, we find rare variants, but many of those rare rare variants are in are homozygous. Mm -hmm. You know, so and the, and the perfect example is the Christchurch variant. I mean, how lucky was it to find that? I mean, here's a an incredibly rare variant that happened to show up in a family that has an incredibly rare Alzheimer's mutation, and then it shows up, but it's a homozygous condition. You know, I mean, what's the likelihood of that happening? Yeah. And yet, it, and it turns out to be incredibly informative regarding onset of Alzheimer's. So to me, that's the value of these families, mm -hmm. to find homozygous rare variants that can have these effects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if I can have, have a couple of questions. Now, so the, the presenilin gene, the VS action in gamma secretase does a lot of different things. Um, and I wonder for if it may be some of these other functions of uh, how it affects gamma secretase that may be um, uh, enroll, involved in the pathogenesis of both involved in the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's, but also potentially in, you know, potentially some kind of immune function. Uh, specifically, um, one of uh, one of the uh, cleavage products. What, what, one thing that um, gamma secretase cleaves is LRP1. So could it be that there's a sort of a double hit thing going on where? Uh, by affecting gamma secretase function, yes, you're making a beta 42, but you're also altering LRP function, and that may be both contributing to, to disease pathology. Yeah, that's a super cool idea. And, uh, you know, again, I don't have an answer for that, but, uh, you, you know, you, you open up a whole experimental direction there. I think uh, because I do think that's such a nexus for things happening that uh, to bring presenil and cleavage into the, into the picture would be really, really fascinating. So another um, thing uh, we've observed, you know, so to, as you know, I'm, I'm basically five years behind you trying to do everything that you and Francisco, or five years or more, uh, behind you and uh, Dr. Lopera and what you're doing in Colombia, I'm trying to do with these families in Mexico. Um, one of the things that we've observed is uh, just incidentally, just we're drawing blood from folks at risk for these mutations and measuring all kinds of things, you know, hypothesis free, right? Um, and one of the things that seem to be, uh, seems to be consistent over the years is that uh, the mutation carriers have a slightly lower lymphocyte count. Hmm. Uh, it's, not, it's not in the pathological range, but on average, it's slightly lower. And we're looking at that now, and there may, it looks like they're, they have a higher, I think it's um, uh, a higher, I can't remember if it's CD8 or CD4, but the ratio of CD8 and CD, CD4 are different. Um, and is it, is it that? Is it somehow it's, uh, there's some role of gamma secretase in lymphocyte differentiation, apparently, of course, this is all any, nothing that I had any idea about. Um, is it, might that be a way that Im they're affecting immunity? Um, yeah, so there is, um, I think, a very uh, interesting direction here um, that you're picking up on, which is um, the roles of presenilin mutations uh, independent of their um, contribution to uh, to A beta generation. And um, indeed, that's true. Actually, you know, this the kinds of uh, intramembranous cleavage that presenilin does is very important in the hematopoietic system and lymphocyte generation because um, it cleaves notch, which is part of that pathway. And um, so I um, really think when we have to start thinking about some of these um, factors that are unrelated to um, A beta and still bring in the fact that. Uh, Presenilin is such a strong driver of the disease. Um, what you're talking about is, you know, absolutely germane. So I can keep going unless others have questions. <laughs> yeah, Ken, that's wonderful up update. Exciting to see where the tau linkages are going. Um, this LRP. Uh, are you hypothesizing it may be critical not only for AD, but CTE and CBD? Um, and what do we know about the, you know, polymorphisms in LRP and right. their 
conveyance of vulnerability to these other diseases and even prion disease? Yeah, good. Well, thanks for the question, Helena. Um, I definitely think, uh, my own opinion, that um, LRP1 is going to be very important for all telepathies um, because uh, CTE and the others uh, also involve tau spread. Um, the initiation point may be a little different for CTE than it is for Alzheimer's, but tau spread seems to be very important. And I think that um, LRP1 is uh, crucial for, um, for all of that. Um, what was the other part of your question? You had another aspect to it. Uh, yeah, what is known about the polymorphisms, the polymorphisms. Yes. and their relationship to disease susceptibility? Yeah. We, we looked a lot for polymorphisms in LRP1 and uh, didn't, didn't get any really, uh, didn't see it very much in the literature about that. So more to come. <laughs> more to come. <laughs> Good. I, there's a couple of questions in the chat. If you, uh, should I read them, John? Yep, go crazy. Uh, okay, here's one from Margaret Burnett. Uh, do we have an idea of the function of LRP1 receptor? Um, would blocking it to stop tau migration lead to other pathology? So indeed, uh, as, I, you know, as I mentioned, LRP1 is uh, picking up a lot of uh, debris in the extracellular space. It's uh, particularly picking up um, uh, proteins that have stretches of lysine in them, just like tau does. So it has a certain selectivity. It doesn't just pick up all debris. Uh, and um, that must be one of its functions. I don't know. There must be others as well. Uh, blocking it to stop migration, of course, seems like a good idea, but because it has all these other functions, it's not immediately obvious that you just want to knock it down. Um, but we are right now, a big direction of our research is to find the region on LRP1 where tau is binding, um, that we have preliminary data may be uh, distinctive compared to some of the other regions where other proteins bind. You know, LRP1 is a huge protein with all these repeats and everything, and it's really tricky to work with. Um, but we think if we can find a region there that's quite selective for tau, the tau interaction, then we're on to a, a small molecule search to interrupt that. So if I just may speculate, uh, um, the idea is very appealing that um, the Presenting mutations are being selected for because of potential advantage in the face of smallpox. Um, I will have to put out the alternative um, possibility, and that is one thing that I've seen. Here's an example of a patient with a presenting mutation. I won't name names here, but I saw a patient that was a young woman uh, who was from Lithuania, and she had a presenting mutation, and uh, her whole story was very clear that basically what she, she had come to the United States as essentially a mail order bride, right? And I'm getting her history and they're like, yes, you know, and they unearthed it, yes, there was sort of known that maybe her, her mom had something, but they called it encephalitis. So I have a feeling that I, want, I wonder if she was uh, uh, encouraged to outbreed uh, because of maybe knowledge within the community that this was going on in her genome, right? Whatever it was, right? It might not have been defined. So I wonder if what we're seeing is people who are kicked out of Europe, right? Or people who, who came, the, the Spaniards who came to, to settle or the conquistadors were ones who their options were, were more limited where they were. I mean, I guess everybody came to the, uh, the Europeans came to the, everybody came to the Europeans came to the New World for their own reasons, each one, but to seek a better life by new opportunities is sort of a common theme. So I wonder if that, there's an element of that happening too. But I guess you, you point out that in like an E280A, it's on the background of a, a Spanish uh, uh, sequence, um, whereas some of them are of Native American origin. So this uh, that's very that's very in interesting work identifying where the gene came from specifically, and that's something I'd like to do more of in the the Mexican families as well. Yeah. So um, so in, your, in the Jalisco families, it would be very straightforward to do that. We would really be love to work with you on that. It's it's, it's yeah. pretty easy. Um, the um, you know the thing about all these genetics is, and, and this applies to what I'm saying with this uh, speculation about the uh, positive selection is, is that it's um, these these sort of uh, 
you know, as Roger Kipling said, these just so stories are really easy to come up with. Um, what's hard is to actually get the statistical proof for any of these ideas. And that's, uh, that's a big challenge. But I mean, if you do prove that there's an effect on immunity, like if it protects against smallpox, <laughs> you get <laughs> Right, right, now that would be cool. Just uh, one more question. Now, in, in your assays of looking at things relating to tau spread, um, did uh, have you studied or did connexin ever come up as a as a target? Um, um, no, uh, that that um, it's a it is a, I, I know that gene a little bit, and it really would be very fascinating to find that you could start to um, come up with some different uh, biological ideas for why it would be important, but we have not seen variants in um, connexin uh, to this point. Well, so I understand we're recording this. Uh, did you know that? Did you give permission for that? Uh, yes, I was asked in advance and uh, was told that it's okay, and now you have that recorded as well. There you have my <laughs> approval. <laughs> yeah. Can I have Okay. Yeah, I, I wanted to uh, say we'd love to hear more from uh, Justin Ichida, who's at the Broad um, Stem Cell uh, Regenerative Medicine at USC, and uh, uh, how the two of you might be collaborating. And we're very honored today to have Dr. Marty Samuels with us. Oh, and my gosh. We'd love to hear, yeah, Dr. Samuels, how things are going at uh, Brigham and Women and your research Institute, um, as you as you left the chair of neurology uh, uh, a few years ago, I think. So first from Justin, who had a question, and maybe Justin, you can tell us what you're doing, and then from Dr. Samuels. Okay. Mark, if you're you're on the talk. I really like to uh, say hello, but let's hear from Justin first. <laughs> yeah, I mean we're um, we're Ken and I. So one of those families that Ken showed, uh, he's he actually sent blood. He collected blood cells from one of the living members, and it's a TDP43 uh, mutation carrier. And they and they sent us the blood, and we generated iPS cells, um, and then we sh we sent the iPS cells back to Ken's lab at Santa Barbara, and we've both been looking at it because we have several um, approaches that we think could be therapeutically efficacious for TDP43 carriers, and we're testing them and. Um, you know, maybe with an eye towards uh, fast tracking some treatments for these folks. Um, I think that'd be very exciting. Um, yeah, I, I would just add that I think that we've, um, Justin and I have like all kinds of possibilities and actually implemented a number of collaborations. We've worked together in the Tau Consortium for a while already. And uh, we have, uh, you know, um, USC and UCSB both received these uh, French foundation professorships. Um, we're going to be meeting tomorrow with that group, so um, I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for our institutions to uh, to work together, Helena. Yeah, and I was glad to hear you and John linking up uh, for yeah. the Jalisco presenolone mutation. That would be yeah. really great. Advisory board meeting next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, I, that's right. So Marty's out there somewhere, maybe. Let Dr. Samuels unmute. <laughs> can't hear you yet, um, Marty. We can't hear you, Marty. Right. Sorry. There, you there we I'm go. Unmuted. Thank you. You'll have to start it. Uh, I'm much better. I'm much better muted than I am. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Kenny. It's great to see you. Uh, yes. I heard about the last half of your talk. I was uh, seeing patients, and I couldn't uh, couldn't quite get away for the. For the beginning, but it is so great to see you uh, see you again and hear about your work on Tau. Nice work when we're in amyloid center to hear somebody speak <laughs> and talk about Tau. Yeah, uh, I was just uh, he recently uh, hearing from um, David Holtzman about some exciting work that he has done in uh, uh, graphs of mice to uh, stem the tide of uh, of the spread of uh, Tau using some interesting techniques, but. And yeah, that's off the subject, uh, somewhat off the subject. It'd be nice to cure the tauopathies, huh? We'd have no PSP anymore. That's right. Well, yeah. Helena, I, it's so great to see you. I just sent you somebody uh, you probably know uh, recently. And uh, thank you. Susan sends her best, too. And we're, 
we're wishing that we were sitting there at that outside cafe in downtown LA with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have fond memories. And I always tell your stories about ta Takasubo and cardiogenic oh, yes. shock. It's uh, and the cardiunculus. Cardunculus, yeah, oh, the cardunculus. Excuse me. Cardunculus. That's a, a little bit of a neologism, yeah. yes. but uh, it, it's great, Ken. It's so good to see that you've uh, you've accelerated your work in your new environment. It's such a beautiful place there that it must be hard to work, but uh, you seem to be doing all right. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, for those that don't know, uh, Marty was my chairman for many, many years at the Brigham. So uh, it's great to see you, Marty. Yeah, thirty years I was the chair. I, I stepped down two years ago, Lena, from the chair. I figured 30 years, time to give somebody else a chance uh, to do it. Tracy Bachelor has succeeded me, neuro-oncologist. And I'm doing everything else I'm doing exactly the same as before. Yeah. Teaching and seeing patients and so on. So the one good thing about all this is that we can have meetings like this and, uh, and see people who otherwise would never see at Grand Round. It's really a great thing. Yeah. Well, what's interesting here is that now, um, you know, we have all the students on and they get to hear the schmooze part of uh, our conversation as well. <laughs> it's not an insignificant component of it, right? A lot of the yeah. ideas. I remember uh, wandering around in Colombia with an O. Colombia, uh -huh. you, Kenny. Yes. Uh, meeting, meeting families that you were, you were studying and uh, impressed that you could speak Spanish so well. Well, I don't know about so well, but I do get that. <laughs> Really great to see you. No kidding. Yeah, likewise. Great. Well, uh, well, thank you. If that's and others, there's, there's certainly a lot of science that was communicated, and lots of areas of diverse interest could be uh, stimulated. But if there are no further questions. Appreciate you doing this, and uh, I'll be bombarding you with uh, questions offline. Indeed. Let's get in touch, John. That sounds great. See you, Ken. Come on, see us after this uh, thing is over. And you too, okay. Helena. I haven't seen you. <laughs> I'm coming to see you. Great. Welcome. This Let me know. Yeah, when yeah. we're all out of quarantine. And, yeah. <laughs> and Marty, don't forget to visit us too in Santa Barbara when you're out here. Oh, but believe me, I will not forget. <laughs> See all you guys. It's great to see you, really. Great. Thank you. Thanks okay. so much, Ken. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You very much. Bye bye.